Uh, I want to start today by welcoming our very special guest, uh, who is a close friend of Joel's and mine since high school, Dr. David Seal. Uh, Dr. Seal is an assistant clinical professor for the Department of Osteopathic Surgical Specialties at Michigan State University College Osteopathic Medicine. Now, I'm going to totally butcher this, but I've been practicing it all morning, <laughs> Dr. Seal. He is on the advisory council for the Michigan Otolaryngological Society. Did I close. say it right? Say it. Otolaryngo Otolaryngology Society, but close. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives lots of presentations each year uh, on the subject. Uh, he loves family. Ever since Joel and I have known him, huge family, always fat family gathering and a very welcoming family. We were always welcome in his household. Uh, he loves skiing. He loves the band po The Police, a favorite song that we have in common is Roxanne. Oh, yeah. And he used to drive Joel and I around in his black Toronado when we were in high school. It was a Toronado, right? Diesel. Diesel, that's right. It was the diesel tornado. And that and it literally was like being chauffeured around in a limousine if you sat in the back. So <laughs> Dr. Seal, welcome to Lunch with Rob and recording of a live Zoom audience for the Do Nothing podcast. Thank you so much for doing this today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Rob. Uh, first I want to start by asking you if you looking back just over 30 days ago. How has your life changed as a doctor? Upside down, dramatically changed. My, put it this way, I would not usually be sitting here at 12 o'clock being able to do a podcast on a, a Tuesday afternoon. That's how dramatic. I mean, it's completely 100% turned around. Um, my day, which usually starts at about 6 a.m., usually with either procedures or surgeries. Uh, these are usually elective surgeries that are done, um, are completely canceled at this point. They're delayed. So we're not doing any surgical uh, procedures at, at any surgical center or hospital at this point um, to preserve um, PPEs, these personal protective equipment, as well as to preserve room and space in the hospitals and to avoid exposure in the hospital. So that aspect of my practice has completely changed. And even in my office as practice, uh, where we see patients, um, multiple patients throughout the day, um, we are only seeing urgent and emergent patients now. We do a lot of telehealth appointments to try to keep people out of the office and at home, uh, safe at home. So we're trying to do a lot of telehealth appointments, which um, allows them to stay safe and trying to uh, interact with patients and help them. But obviously, this can be very difficult. So our, 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 my day has completely changed. Um, I've got a lot more family time, which has been fantastic. At, in the evening, I've got a lot more time to spend with my kids and my wife and um, which has been fun and, and a lot of fun and fantastic, but I, I find it very uh, unnerving too, because I, I wake up some days where I'm supposed to be in surgery and I'm kind of sitting there kind of wondering what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned your family, your wife, Debbie, and you have four kids for all of you uh, listening and participating today. Two of the, he has two sets of twins. So it, it, it could be a pretty busy household. They're all teenagers now. And uh, how has it been? I know you said it's been great, you know, being with the family, but how is it, how has it been coming to and from the hospital and from your, from your medical requirements? And are, how do you interact with them at home and ensure everybody's staying safe? Well, that's a great question. So usually um, my day, I'm wearing a shirt and a tie usually every day. So that even from that aspect, from the minute I get up and I put on my clothes, I'm wearing scrubs now. And the reason is because I wear scrubs during the day, they're easily washable and I wanna be careful with transmission of virus. I wear a, a coat each day and my coat, I change. The virus can only live on typically on clothing and stuff for no more than five days. So basically every Monday I have a Monday coat, every Tuesday I have a Tuesday coat and so forth. My scrubs I change every day, but my interaction is so when I, when I get dressed in the morning, I put my scrubs on, I have a certain pair of shoes that I wear. Um, at the end of the day, when I come home, obviously my coat stays in the office and it, it gets put away for, for the following week, you know, for that following Monday. But when I come home, shoes stay in the garage. Um, I basically come into our mud room. I disrobe, take off my scrubs, um, jump in the shower and put clothing on. Uh, those, those scrubs get cleaned every day. Uh, so I don't even touch or really interact with my kids or my wife until all of that is kind of disrobed, which is mm. a completely different experience from what I normally would do. 
when, when you when you're taking everything out, do you put it in a bag or something and then bring it back to be cleaned, or how does that work? Well, no, I mean, I put it right in the wash. So I'll take it, throw it right in the washing machine at that point, and everything gets washed. And then I jump in the shower and then get dressed. Okay. Uh, but no, really contact with anyone in the family other than the dog, who's usually is sitting there waiting for me um, until I get basically dressed again. So I've had numerous evenings in particular where I might wake up and I feel like kind of achy or I think I have like a sore throat and then I, I go, oh my God, I must have the virus. So I'm just curious, like, do you have those same moments? Do you, you know, especially being around it so much? Absolutely. Absolutely. Days that I'm more congested, days that I have a little bit of a sore throat or a little bit of a tickle or a cough. And especially every day I'm wearing an N95 mask like I have here. Um, and I've got several of these that we're using and these masks are, and you, a lot of you probably have been wearing them, um, are very, just very um, tight and they just feel uncomfortable and they make you feel more congested. So when I take this mask off, I almost feel like I've got more of a congestion or runny nose. And so the mask I think plays a big role in it too. But yeah, I mean, it's just mentally knowing that, you know, with only one specific symptom or a couple of things that I know I, I, I'm not coming down with symptoms, I can tell usually if I start to feel like I'm getting sick and none of it has been that bad so far. Mm -hmm. What's it like in the hospital these days? Like, could you paint a picture for us that are curious and that, you know, think we, we read different things about how it's so crowded and kind of, you know, crazier than normal? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a totally different environment. So even from the point of where you walk in, so I'm on staff at several of Beaumont and Ascension and St. Joe hospitals, Beaumont specifically, I'll pick one. Um, there's only two entrances at one of the Beaumont hospitals that I go to that are that are open that you can walk into. And when you walk in that entrance, um, you actually, all of them, all the people that are greeting you are masked. You have to fill out an electronic form as an employee or a, a doctor. You have to fill out an electronic form that's basically saying you've had no new symptoms, you have no fever. They're usually checking your temperature and you basically are attesting that you are healthy, that you don't have any COVID symptoms. Um, and typically you're wearing a mask as soon as you walk in. And anyone that you see, whether it's in the hallway or in a room, is basically wearing masks now. And you see just, I mean, it's, it's a very different atmosphere. It's very, um, uh, you know, very surreal that you're just walking in and you see this, this environment that is completely different from what you, you know, what you normally would see. You know, people that you're saying hello to, you, it's hard to even tell who's who because everyone has these masks on and um, PPEs on. So it's hard to even distinguish who's who. Oh, which makes it difficult. I mean, even your friends or people that you know, it's you, you sometimes don't even know that that's them because everyone's where everyone looks the same. Mm -hmm. Do people wear things over their eyes as well? They do. They'll wear face masks um, or they'll wear goggles or glasses, depending on which department you're in. The emergency room is, is completely a separate entity where really no one is going in and out of the emergency room unless they absolutely have to be there. Uh, but everyone in the operating rooms and in the preoperative areas do have some sort of face uh, guard on, whether it's a shield or it may just be glasses, um, protective glasses that are over their glasses. Mm -hmm. are, are patients uh, able to be served efficiently? Are they uh, in hallways or do they have their, you know, the normal little rooms or shared rooms? You know, what, what's it look like there? So it depends on the, on the point on where you are in the hospital. In the COVID areas, they're trying to keep everyone separate, everyone in their own individual room. Um, and the non-COVID areas of the hospital where someone will come in, let's say they had um, a, uh, a appendectomy, you know, because people are still getting sick. People still have appendixes that need to come out and small bowel obstructions or, or whatever may be going on. They still have these issues are still happening every day. Those parts of the hospital, uh, people are sharing rooms as they had in the past, as long as they're non-COVID. Um, or they have individual rooms, depending on the situation in the hospital that they're in. The emergency rooms are a little bit different. The emergency rooms are definitely people in the hallways, um, people in different areas of the emergency center that are more specifically um, in almost in um, public areas of the emergency department because they don't have their outer room to put them in their own private space. So yes, you would walk through the emergency room and it looks almost as you see on TV, just people lined up in the hallways on gurneys. Jeez. Uh, do you follow the national news? And, and if you do, how's it compare to what you're seeing? Um, the national news, I think, is pretty, for the most part, what I'm seeing, which is, you know, CNN and, and some of the major headlines, I'm seeing what, you know, it's painting a very accurate picture, especially Michigan and Southeast Michigan, which we have, we're one of the, obviously one of the hotspots 
I think we were third last time I saw behind uh, New York and I think New Jersey, um, as far as the amount of patients that we have. And it's definitely reflected in the national news. So I am following it. And um, I think for the most part, it's been fairly accurate. Each one of the institutions that I go to, one of the big things they always talk about is these um, PPEs and masks and gowns and things and the amount of equipment that they have. Um, the hospitals that I go to, we've been fairly lucky that we have a good supply, a decent supply. We're always looking for more, but we have not run out where I think there are some hospitals and institutions in Southeast Michigan that have had more of, a, of an issue with that. Um, but I'm not in those facilities. When, when you're at the hospital, what are you doing now that might be different than in the past? Uh, well, like I was saying, so it's everything from wearing the mask and, and not touching or shaking hands or doing anything like that with anyone. But it's um, as far as the procedures that we're doing. So one of the issues is ventilators. Is um, there's, there's a shortage or a, a, an issue with ventilators. Our hospitals are now starting to ramp up and have more ventilators available because we're starting to see that, that kind of that peak start to taper down a little bit. So we're not, is, the ventilators are not in as much demand right now. But what we were doing initially is the patients that were non-COVID patients that are on ventilators, which we normally have a good amount of patients that just on a normal day that are on ventilators, we're trying to get those patients off ventilators. And one of the things that I do is we do tracheostomies where we do a surgical airway into the trachea, which helps to wean people off ventilators. So we were doing more of these right off the bat to try to get ventilators available for the COVID patients. So that was something different that we were doing um, prior to the COVID outbreak. Mm. What's changed procedurally wise, like say like in the operating room, is, is it, are things different or? Much different for specifically for what I do, I'm a, you know, for ear, nose and throat. Um, the first, one of the first doctors in China that passed away from COVID was an ear, nose and throat doctor. And the reason is the abundance of the virus living in the nasal cavity and the back of the throat, which is what I do every day. Um, that's why they swab the back of the nose, the nasal pharynx for COVID. That's, you know, the, the test, the PCR test that they're doing right now. Um, that's where they're swabbing because that's where the most abundance of the virus lives. So when we're operating in that area, it will aerosolize that virus and allow it to travel in the air and it can last in the air for up to three hours. So one of these, some of these procedures that we'll do, in, in fact, that tracheostomy procedure, we don't recommend doing them on COVID patients because that if we do it on a COVID patient, it can aerosolize in the operating room and it can last in the air for up to three hours. So everyone in that operating room has to have an N95 mask and it has to have proper PPE on. And we try to limit the amount of people in the operating room. Well, sometimes there'll be nurses that will come in and out and give breaks or people observing medical students, which are no longer um, allowed in the operating room with us. Even junior residents, we don't have. We only have the, a limited amount of people in there and it's the most highly skilled people. And everyone has to have the proper PPE on for a COVID patient that we're operating on or even a suspected COVID patient. Do and we're you, trying to preserve the PPE too. So by limiting the staff in the operating room, it allows us to preserve those, those masks because everyone doesn't have to be wearing them as they walk in and out. Do you, do you have to test uh, for, for non-COVID procedures? Do you have to test the uh, patient before you bring so, them in? Yeah, the recommendation right now is any procedure, an ENT procedure, which I'm involved in, they have to be tested prior. And if they are COVID positive, we try to wait on that procedure for a minimum of three weeks to let that virus shed so that we can then operate on them once that virus has kind of passed through and they're not actively infected. We can go ahead. So, but if it's an emergent procedure, someone's airway is closing off and we have to get a, a tracheostomy tube into them, we have no option at that point. But all, all procedures other than that type of procedure, we do test and we try to postpone that procedure until uh, that the COVID is negative, which usually will take up to about three weeks on those patients that we can. Mm. Um, do you find yourself uh, with certain things getting frustrated at all? I mean, is there anything about this, this whole situation that, you know, kind of... Well, from the beginning when there was, I think, a little less knowledge, and this is, I say beginning, this is even just a few weeks ago when we started doing like, the, let's say these tracheostomies. And I um, said that everyone in my operating room needs to have one of these masks and have all the proper PPE and administration at the time had limitations on the mask. They didn't have a lot. And they didn't know when their next supply was going to be. And they said, you know, they were like, no, we're not going to let all the nurses have them. You can have one being the surgeon and the anesthesiologist or whoever's assisting you, but the nurses, the other nurses in the room can't. And I had to explain and actually show them articles and literature that from China and Iran and other countries that had gone through this already, 
showing that everyone in that operating room has to have the proper protection or they're at risk for developing COVID. So that was very frustrating at the beginning, just trying to share this with administration so they understood that we're not just doing this for our own you know, well-being, it's for, that, for everyone in my operating room, for all the staff. Mm -hmm. For you and maybe some of the other doctors, um, how would your stress level be in comparison to normal times? Well, it's a totally different stress. I mean, it's every day now, even in my office when I'm seeing patients, we've cut, like I said, to only urgent emergent cases in the office, but we still are seeing patients regularly in the office for different reasons. And any patient that walks in can definitely be atypical, like an asymptomatic COVID carrier. So I'm always just very, very concerned. Am I, is this the patient that has it? And making sure that we're all protected as best as we can. And we have limited PPEs for our office too, which is very frustrating. That's another frustration is we have a hard time getting these masks. The hospital have a much easier time than the doctor's offices. Um, we usually don't order these masks. So our suppliers won't typically supply these to us because we have no history of ordering them. They're trying to supply them all to the, the doctors in the hospitals, but the issue is we're trying to keep these patients that don't necessarily need to go to the emergency room out of the emergency room by seeing them in our office to keep them safer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's frustrating because sometimes we're not able to get the proper PE, PPE for our office and our staff in our office. All right, let, let's open it up to anyone that might have some questions. Just raise your hand and uh, I'll, I'll give you a shout. Uh, John, John Dickinson, come on up mute. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, doctor. I, I keep hearing about asymptomatic. So uh, my question is, if you're asymptomatic, does that mean you just haven't developed the symptoms yet? Or do some people actually contract the virus and never really develop symptoms? So I caught part of that. But um, if you're asymptomatic, if you don't have symptoms, you can still have it and never develop symptoms. So it doesn't mean that it's early in the stage and you may develop symptoms. But you may be asymptomatic and never develop any symptoms. And what we're seeing now actually is one of the earlier symptoms that we're seeing that wasn't reported initially is loss of smell and taste. And that's one of the things as an ENT I'm seeing regularly and I'm doing a lot of telehealth visits where patients calling up saying, not having coughing or fever, but I just lost my sense of taste and smell. And that's an early sign of COVID and that may be the only sign they develop. Um, so it's not necessarily that it's gonna follow a textbook pattern, but you may be totally asymptomatic and still be a carrier, still have it. Thanks, John. Who else? Uh, Liz, come on up, you. Hi, doctor. Hi. Uh, I just had a quick question about masks and wearing masks to the grocery store when we go out. So I've heard some people say that it only works for people that are already sick and it helps prevent their germs from leaving. Um, but just your opinion, do the masks actually help even if you're not sick, but to try to protect you? Definitely, I think it acts as a barrier. So I definitely feel that at this point in Southeast Michigan, where we live in the abundance of COVID here, you definitely should be wearing a mask anytime you're doing any kind of potential contact with anyone. It definitely protect, protects the person that is sick and that especially it's from coughing and sneezing. That's where we see most of the transmission from but also it helps you hopefully prevent you from touching your face. And one of the keys is making sure that mask is fitting properly. It's gotta fit over your nose and your mouth and around the chin and can't have really gapping on the sides because that will let air through it. So it's really gotta fit tightly um, around to really protect you the best. Okay, great question, Liz. Who else? Justin. I think we would need to shave if we wanted a mask to wear properly. I'm sorry, I missed that. Does that mean we would need to shave to have the mask properly? So that's a great question too. Yes, all healthcare providers, anyone in the hospital um, is asked to shave because it's going to definitely cause more gapping. There are things that um, people are getting, uh, healthcare workers are developing a lot of rashes and skin irritation from the masks too. And there's actually some ointments that we're recommending to put on the face and um, applications for the face that help prevent it. But definitely you want to have uh, minimum hair on for, you know, to help protect and prevent that, that from happening. Great, great question. Carol, I saw your hand go up, go ahead. Yeah, kind of piggybacking off the question that Liz asked, because hers was kind of pointed to more indoor activities, but there are more people going out for walks just around their neighborhood. Is it important to also be wearing the mask? Then what's the best way for us to still get outside, get fresh air and keeping ourselves and others safe? 
I think as long as you're outside and not close to others and in group area, you are okay to not have a mask. I go out walking with my family or hiking with the family or biking. We are not wearing masks as long, and we're, but we are keeping our distance from others. And I think as long as you're keeping your distance from others, it's fine to have fresh air outside. It's really when you're in close contact or indoors that you wanna make sure you have that mask on. Great. Tracy, I saw your hand go up. Thank you. What do you feel is the best indicator that things could go back to normal? Oh, it's a great question. I wish I had that <laughs> magic answer. To me, it's going to, things are going to go back to normal. It's going to be different in different parts of our country and different parts of the world. Um, we are one of the earlier locations that I think had a kind of a spike for COVID in Southeast Michigan. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel our curve is starting to flatten out and we're gonna to start to see definitely a, a major decrease. And all the hospitals I'm at, I see the numbers every single day as far as how many patients are diagnosed, how many patients are on ventilators, how many patients are coming off ventilators, and our numbers are dropping. We're seeing less and less infected people. The death toll is still unfortunately still fairly high, but I think we've come to a peak here. And as that comes down, I think we're gonna to start to see a little bit more of normality, but the biggest thing is gonna be testing. Um, right now, they're doing these nasal testing, the PCR testing, but also the essays, which is an antibody test, which there's one company currently in the uh, U.S. that's FDA approved, and there's uh, several that are currently trying to undergo FDA approval. And that will show who has been infected and who has developed antibodies um, to this coronavirus. And I think as we get more people tested, both on the antibody and the PCR test, we'll be able to kind of tell which direction this is going. Um, but I think the testing is going to be the, the, the next thing that really has to ramp up to be able to go back to a, a normal situation. Vaccines, I think, are still going to be obviously the, the choice, but that's far off still. Dr. Seal, I, I, um, I read that at Beaumont they were doing an antibody study. Would, will you be participating in that? They currently are. Employees are asked if they want to participate. Um, I just got information on this yesterday. They just announced Beaumont is doing, I think it's one of the largest studies in the country on this essay testing. And I most likely will, as well as my staff uh, and my residents as well. But um, just because we've had some people that have been exposed at some point. Um, but I think it's great that Beaumont is uh, taking that initiative and, and helping with, the, uh, with these essay testing. Because the more we can get these out there, uh, in people's hands, the quicker we're going to be able to resolve it. And, and the whole, the, the goal is that people will be able to do these at home eventually, such as when you do a genetic testing where you spit in a tube and send it in the lab and you get your genome. Um, the hope is that we'll be able to do this with, uh, with these types of tests as well in the future. Danny, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Dr. Seal. Thanks for joining us today. A uh, sure. couple questions. You mentioned the antibody test. If you, if it shows that you have developed the antibodies, does that mean that you can't get the virus again or are you just immune for a few months? What does that mean? And that's a great question. There's still studies that are going on with this. There was just actually some information that came out of China. Um, they had about 100 people that had supposedly been infected, recovered from it, had developed antibodies and then became reinfected. And they're still trying to figure out how they got reinfected. Is it a different strain of the virus? Um, is it that it just got reactivated? Or is it just that the virus is still lingering on in the system and their second test that they had that showed that they were negative was actually a false negative? Um, so, you know, it's still too early to tell if you can get reinfected or not. They're still coming out. And this, this changes literally every day, it seems to change. So we don't know yet that if you can get reinfected, we don't know. Um, the, the thought process is once you develop antibodies um, that you hopefully won't get reinfected, but we're not sure at this point yet. Gotcha. My, my second question is, uh, when I've been going to the grocery store, I, I have been wearing a mask, but when I get home, I've, I'm not sure if this is overboard or not, but I've been wiping down all my groceries with disinfectant wipes. Is that overboard or is that? Not at all. It's smart. If you, can, if you can wipe off the packages, that's the best thing you're going to do is wipe those off. Try to keep them as clean as possible. Um, letting packages sit. The virus can live on certain, certain things for certain amounts of time. On cardboard, it can live for 24 hours. On copper, for four hours. Aluminum, it can uh, loom for three days. And certain metals, it can loom for three days. And, uh, and it can loom for three hours in the air. Even there are some studies that will show it can loom up to six hours. Um, so these are all things. Wiping that down is definitely a good idea. And also keeping your mask, by the way, in a paper bag, if you are using a mask. I don't know if people know this. 
a paper bag, it absorbs the moisture. You don't want to carry it in a plastic bag or keep it in a, in a closed plastic or a Ziploc bag. You actually want to put it almost like a lunch bag because it will absorb the moisture and help prevent that virus from sticking to the mask. Thank you, doctor. You're Great. welcome. Grace. Yeah, hello. So I know that you mentioned um, that we're, you know, hopefully close to flattening the curve and on the other side of the peak. But my question is in regards to Michigan, at least, it seems like I'm hoping we're at the peak. But nationally, where do you think we're at? And then also worldwide? That's a great question. I'm not as, um, as um, knowledgeable on worldwide as far as following the worldwide curve. As far as the nation, I think Michigan is on the earlier, you know, we were one of the earlier um, cities to, to kind of peak at this, uh, as well as New York. But I think nationally, we are still not at the peak. I think nationally, we're looking at probably at least through the end of May um, and into the beginning of June before we start to see national levels coming down significantly, where I feel in Michigan, we're going to come down significantly before, you know, around the 1st of May, we should be down significantly. But I think it's going to be at least another four to six weeks nationally to see that. But worldwide, I'm not sure. And I, I don't have an answer for you there. I'm sorry. Uh, did I see a hand go up for a sec? Rachel Henk. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Seal. Um, I have to imagine that these changes and the stress is taking a toll on, on you, your family, how are you all taking care of yourselves right now? I appreciate that. Yes, it is. It is. And it's really trying to unwind when I get home. So after a day, it's like I said, I get home, change the clothes, shower, and trying to spend time with the family and kids and just try to kind of, like I was saying, unwind and, and get rid of my day. Um, we like to go outside and do walks and do things with my children. You know, one of the things is because of what I do, and my wife's a physician as well, both both of what we do, we, we don't tend to spend as enough time with our children as we'd like to. And these past four weeks, we've been playing board games, we've been doing walks, we've been doing things with our kids that we never got to do before. We're eating, we used to eat dinner maybe once or twice a night together just because, or I mean, once or twice a week together because all the kids are involved in so many different activities that everyone's going and coming that now there's no activities and we're eating dinner together every single night. So it's actually a blessing. I told my wife, I'm like, this is you know, obviously it's not a blessing in the, in the sense of what's going on, but just getting our family together and a community together. It's, I mean, it's brought us together much closer than I can have ever imagined before. So in that sense, I think it's just being with family that really has helped us, us get it through, you know, get through this. That's beautiful. I have a question, Dave. Are you guys ordering out food? Oh my God, like you never believe. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not worried about ordering out? No, we do cook. Uh, we're cooking a lot, um, definitely a lot, but we're, we're probably ordering out, I'm going to say, at least twice a week. Um, we try to do hot food if we order out. We're trying to be smart about it, but we're also trying to support our local restaurants just because our, you know, obviously they're having a hard time. So we're trying to do as much as we can to support some of the local restaurants that we love and hopefully help to keep them in business once this does uh, subside. Cool. Chris Me, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, hi, Dr. Seal. Um, hey, good talking to you. You, um, you have a question for, I hear a lot of um, people say that, you know, to take vitamin C, zinc, that sort of thing, it helps the body fight this disease. Do you have recommendations, I guess, for all of us to say, hey, this is what you should be eating. These are the vitamins you should be taking. So that if you get the disease, you have a better chance of not getting real sick with it. Yeah, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, some of the natural health supplements are all supposed to help build the immune and boost the immune system. Anything you can do to obviously boost the immune system, getting rest, eating healthy, um, zinc, vitamin C, and vitamin D are the three big ones that I've seen, um, that have come up recently. Um, but obviously making sure you're eating healthy, staying away from, you know, if you can process foods, things like that, exercise, getting enough rest are all beneficial. Um, but no studies that I've seen specifically with coronavirus that have shown what you eat are going to change the outcome of the coronavirus um, epidemic. But just obviously building your immune system is a whole separate situation just to prevent, prevent any other problems or ailments from coming as well. Because you can still get sick, obviously, with other colds and flus besides the coronavirus this time of year as well. Okay, Melina typed her question into the chat. She said, I heard the virus isn't that hard to kill on most surfaces. Is that true? And can my more natural household cleaners kill the virus? So on the household surfaces, what you really want to make sure is you're using a, a, um, a uh, material or a liquid that has at least 70% alcohol. 
So it's got to be 70% based alcohol, hand, hand wash, or something that you're using on counters or chairs or anything like that, steering wheels, things like that. So that's the key is you want it to have at least a 70% alcohol content. And that should kill the virus. Great. She says, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Emmy. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Steele. Hi. Hospitals on a regular basis have disaster drills and preparations for different things. Um, I don't want to dismiss the enormity of this situation, but why do you think hospitals weren't prepared with the appropriate amount of PPE, just in general? That's a great question. I don't think anyone, whether it's hospital, office, or obviously even the government, was prepared for a pandemic like this. Um, why? That's a great question. I just, I don't know specifically within the hospital system what they typically carry and what their typical, um, what their typical amount of PPEs that they typically have. But I think this just overwhelmed every single system out there. Um, the national supply, the local supplies, um, that it just overwhelmed them. Just they weren't, obviously they weren't prepared. And I'm not sure even these national or these drills that they go through, these um, drills for, and it's usually drills for, you know, chemical spills and, and massive accidents that they have. And um, God forbid, you know, explosions, things like that. I don't think anyone was prepared for such a long pandemic um, pandemic situation here. So I don't have an answer of what, you know, what they should have done, but obviously no one was prepared. And obviously I think this is going to change the future, which I think is the big thing. How do we go forward with this? And I think it's going to change obviously everything in, in the way that we treat patients, but also our preparedness for this in the future. Thanks. Great question. Elaine. Hi, Dr. Sue. Um, I have elderly parents and my father is 85 years old and he has uh, very serious underlying health issues that he's had for a while now. He has an appointment that the hospital, he has to keep it. Um, next week he has an oncology appointment downtown and this weekend I have to take him to get his lab work done before the oncology appointment and his regular doctor is closed because they combined everything into like walk-in facilities and we have no masks. I have gloves, but that's it. So what can I expect when I take him? Will they provide uh, a mask or protective clothing for him while he's there? They most likely will not provide protective clothing and they may not have a mask available just depending on where you go to get this. I would encourage you to get the blood draw at an outpatient center if it's open as opposed to walking into a hospital. So there are outpatient centers like Quest or some of these other labs that you can get it at just because they're going to be less, um, less people there, less contact potential. Um, they may, and you can call and ask if they have a mask available, but I would recommend even wearing even just a bandana or um, some sort of scarf around just so he protects himself and obviously washing his hands, not touching his face, washing his hands after leaving immediately um, is one of the most important things. And then also with the oncology appointment, I know a lot of oncologists are doing telehealth and I don't know if that's an option once they have the lab work that they can look at the lab work and then do a telehealth appointment as opposed to him having to go there for that appointment. It's his, um, it's a shot that he has to have. He has oh, some memories. Gotcha. So we already called and thought maybe they'd postpone it. They said, no, he has to come in, which frightens me to death, but. Sure, and the best thing is obviously washing his hands, wearing a scarf or some sort of protective. I would ask if they do have a mask available before going just to see if there is somehow, somehow you can get that mask to him before he gets out of the car and, and walks into the building as well. Okay. And that may be, they may be able to do that, but making sure he's keeping his hands away from his mouth and obviously washing his, washing uh -huh. his hands regularly and wearing some sort of scarf or protectant um, is better than, than not having anything, obviously. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great. And uh, Marcus. Hey, Dr. Seal. Um, question. Um, Back in October, I know that there was like a whole lot of sickness and, and things going around. I was sick for a couple of weeks. My stepdad was sick for a couple of weeks. And I had 
the loss of taste and smell and all that stuff for, I don't know, a couple of days. Was that COVID back in October or what was that? Because it seems similar. It probably was a similar virus. It probably, it was not COVID-19, which is the virus right. that we're dealing with now. It wasn't in the U.S. at that time, but it was probably a different virus at the time, which can also cause loss of smell, loss of taste. And those are usually temporary. It can cause similar symptoms, congestion, runny nose, those types of things. The difference is with COVID-19, where most of the previous viruses will land themselves in the nose and the upper throat. They'll cause congestion, your normal, um, almost like a cold or flu-like symptoms. This one lands itself further down into the chest and will start to wow. cause fluid to build up. And that's the difference. This one will actually cause wow. inflammation in the chest, almost like you got feeling like you got hit by a bus in your chest wow. and you're having more difficulty breathing. So a different virus, most likely, that you had at that time. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we may have time for about one more question. Anybody else? Grace. Hi, so, you know, I'm very cautious and I've only ordered takeout food once in the last 30 days and I made sure to get hot food that I could heat up again at like 300 yeah. degrees for five, 10 minutes just because I am on the extreme side. Do you think that's really necessary or am I going overboard? No, it, it won't hurt. So if you keep doing that, anything, if you can microwave or heat it, it's going to kill the virus. Make sure you take it out of that container, you know, and put it in your own. Make sure you're washing your hands anytime you touch the container as well. So definitely not overboard. Um, you're being overcautious, which it does not hurt at this point. So if you can continue to do that, do that. You'll be safer. You, Dr. Sue, many years ago, I asked you how you wash your hands. And I'll never forget it. And that's how I wash my hands now. Can you show us or sort of describe <laughs> the best way to wash your hands? Sure. The way that surgeons wash their hands, I'm going to try to show you this, um, is you wash the fingers first. You're washing each individual finger um, with soap and water. Wash the hands like so, making sure you're lathering between the fingers. And then you start washing your wrists and you go up the arm. And you actually keep your arms up so the water will drip from the tips of your fingers down. So you're keeping your hands like this. Otherwise, if you keep them tilted, the dirty water will run back over your fingers. So you always want to make sure you're keeping your hands up. The water will run towards your elbows and then drying them in the same manner from the fingertips down, fingertips down. So that if anything is dirty, so to speak, it would be at your elbows, not at your fingers. Hopefully that helps. It's a great example. <laughs> All right, Dr. Seal, thank you so much for taking right, I'd add yeah, one more, Rob. Do you have time for, for Fred? One more. Oh, yeah, sure. We'll take one more. Go ahead, Fred. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for joining us, Dr. Seal. Um, so we got a bunch of our technicians who are still out in the field. Um, we've got them with face masks and gloves. Um, we even bought the little, like, zip-up bunny suits if they have to go to somewhere that's uh, a little bit more, I guess, dangerous. Um, the question I have is, with the masks that we have, they're like a cloth, like the homemade cloth masks. What's the best way to clean those after visiting the customers and stuff like that? Well, if they get anything on them, if they're wet or moisture um, spills on them, so to speak, I'm not quite sure you're going to be able to clean them effectively. Um, the best, you know, as far as cleaning these, there's different things. There's UV light that they're showing. They're doing these, um, these um, like hydrogen peroxide um, aerosolized cleaning um, techniques now. But as far as a homemade mask, I don't have a great way of cleaning it. It's more of storing it, making sure you're storing it in a paper bag, like I mentioned before, like a, like a lunch bag, making sure that if it does get moisture on it, um, whether it's blood or sweat or anything like that, and it's soaking through it, you're probably going to need a new mask. Um, usually what we'll say is that the virus will live on the mask for up to, we say, up to about five days on the mask. So we're recommending a different mask every day of the week. So every Monday you're wearing your Monday mask, every Tuesday you're wearing your Tuesday mask and so forth. So you're only wearing that mask one day a week so that you can put that mask away and next Monday that mask, if there was a virus on it, it will be clean for that next Monday. The virus cannot live that long on the mask. Gotcha. Yeah, I, my, my cousin works for um, a, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but where they do like the, the blood draw, can't remember the name of it right now. Um, and I've seen that he takes, he's got one of the N95 masks, but I've seen that he's been taking it and putting it in, in the oven, like hanging it from paper clips and cooking it in the oven for uh, like a, at 160 degrees to, does that work for like a sterilization type thing? From what I understand, no. 
from what I understand, no, okay. they're looking at UV light. Some UV lights are supposedly killing some of the pathogens, but I've not heard putting it in the oven or the microwave will clean it. Um, my understanding is I haven't seen any literature that supports that that will actually kill the bacteria. The best, okay. the best thing that I've heard of is using really not using that mask again for seven days is the, is the goal. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Dr. Seal, thanks again. You're the best for doing this. We know how busy you are. But we were so curious. We have so many questions. I appreciate so it. Our gratitude and love goes out to you and your family. Thank you so much for doing this and for joining on the Do Nothing Pod. I really appreciate it. We'll see My you pleasure. soon, okay? Thank you for having me. Thank you again. Okay. You guys stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks, Dave. Love you, buddy. Love you. All right, Thank see you, you guys. Stay